Deborah Powney has recently published her latest research into male victims of coercive control. It's a 40-page report which is very accessible to the lay reader and is well worth reading, but we've been fortunate enough to talk to Deborah about it and she was able to expand on the conclusions she's drawn and discuss its implications. Deborah, I've got in front of me uh, your report, Male Victims of a Coercive Control, Experiences and Impact. And um, it's written by you and uh, Nicola Graham Kevin, who we've also interviewed, um, and also by the Mankind Initiative. And we've asked you to come and talk to us about it. And it would be really interesting to hear the major findings and the things that you've found most interesting now you've done this piece of research. So on the night that it was announced we were going into lockdown, which was March 23rd, I sat down and pulled together a kind of um, wish list survey of what I would like to ask male victims if I had them locked in a room, hoping to get um, a couple of hundred um, participants from the UK. So um, we managed to get, Nick, Nicky and I went through it, cross-checked it, refined it, and then um, got it through ethics all within three weeks. So we were fortunate to get it out when, when we did. Um, and literally it exploded. It went, I went to bed one night with something like 50 participants and woke up the next day with 600 nod. Um, oh. But it actually, it actually got to 1,347 men at the, at the end of, uh, I think it was just over three weeks that the survey was live. So we got this huge amount of data in from all over the world. And um, the, the survey, the actual first survey was regarding intimate partner violence. And I included four psychological scales that in my hypothesis was a pathway to how men experienced uh, intimate partner violence. One survey was looking at the levels of abuse. One was looking at um, uh, traumatic, post-traumatic stress impact. The other was looking at coping mechanisms. And then there was one that was looking at um, post-traumatic growth. I, I also put in um, uh, over 40 questions that, right. um, that the men, uh, they were open and closed questions so that the men could actually give me their experiences if I were for qualitative data. And some men gave me a couple of lines and some men gave me um, es essentially pages of, of data. So the UK cohort that we have in this survey only is only looking at very few questions and is the top line data um, for, for that data set. There is huge amounts of data left to assess. But after we'd done this one, um, I was talking to Nikki about the results as we do and, and crunching them and slicing them. And um, a report came out about coercive control and yet again, didn't include any real narrative or data about male victims. So we were both kind of spitting feathers at each other and Nikki came back to me and said, should we do this again for coercive control? So we agreed, uh, developed that. And then this time I translated it into 22 different languages and we uh, released it and we had 2,086 participants, huge chunks from um, Australia, India, um, America and Canada, and then a smattering uh, around the world. Um, but considering this was one of the first surveys on coercive control uh, of this type, it was uh, very successful. So we've used the UK cohort from that together with the UK cohort from the first survey. And this is a report about that particular group. And one of the things we were looking at is essentially what types of abuse do men experience and what levels do those um, does that abuse come to? And the takeaway message I would like everyone that even considers reading this to take with them 
is men experience coercive control in very similar ways to women. However, there are also types of abuse that men experience because they are men. And those three are the use of children, economic abuse, and legal and administrative abuse. And they are, to use a very um, overused phrase, disproportionately affected in this survey. So it's, um, it's showing that not only do we know that men experience coercive control in the same ways that women do, often the things that are brushed aside or ignored because it happens to men and not women are really important to understanding the experiences uh, that male victims sustain. Deborah, can you give us a couple of examples of each of those three descriptions, those two, those labels? Could you know just make it feel yeah. real for people? Yeah, and that's that's what we've tried to do in this report. This report is a very user friendly report. It's done so that anyone can read it. You don't have to be a psychologist or a statistician. You can read it because I've put um, things like uh, word clouds and and quotes from particular things in here. So, for example, if we're looking at the children category, the, yeah. and I'm going to go through the, the particular three that are, are, are prevalent for men, the children category works both within the relationship and post the relationship. So men are often controlled um, by, chil by having children in the relationship because women will say, um, if, you, if you don't behave in a certain way or do a certain thing or won't um I'm, i'll make sure you don't see your children again and also men tell us that they are terrified frightened fearful of leaving an abusive relationship because we know it is commonplace for women to be given um the the primary residency and men are allowed to have contact and they are terrified that if they leave that abusive relationship, not only will they um, lose the relationship with their children, but they're also terrified of leaving the children with an abuser without any protection. So it's, it's a barrier for men to leave the relationship. But once they have left the relationship, the children is often used against them, either dragging them all the way through court system to fight just to see the children, just to actually have some contact with their, with their own flesh and blood. But even when that happens and, and a contact order is put in place, it, access will be denied, alienation will take place, false allegations are thrown about so that men, no matter what, are still terrified of losing the relationship with their children. If I link that into legal and administrati administrative abuse, yeah. There is a system set up, as we know, to help women. And I have absolutely no issue in that at all. In fact, I think I've told you before, I've benefited from, yeah, from that system myself. Now, that's great. However, that system is set up in such a way that it, it, it not only negates men, it actively excludes men, actively excludes them. So women, of, women that are abusing men, are very aware of this and will often say, and I hate to say it, but we heard it in a very, very famous case that's still going on in America. You know, I'm going to tell them that you're abusing me. You can say whatever you want. Who's going to believe you? You're a man. Mm. You know, so often that legal and administrative system that is set up to protect female victims and children that are vulnerable can be used as a tool of abuse against men and they know that their system is set up to be biased. And then the other um, really major element that has a massive effect on them is economic abuse. And again, within and post the, the relationship. And this, is, this has been completely dismissed. There, are, there have been reports made um, with banks and uh, a leading um, domestic abuse provider and someone who's actually um, heading up a, a charity that really does help women of, of, of economic abuse. But it's set up again and framed again 
as being something that only really happens to women, a gendered issue. And it's not because I, we have data through that men, 50% of men in this survey had their uh, earnings utterly controlled. And when I say utterly controlled, I mean, they had to ask for money to go and buy food when they went to work. And then they had to come back and present receipts. <laughs> and then there was, there was men that were literally starving to death where they, um, they were told what they could eat and when they could eat it. And they weren't allowed any money to go and buy their own. And they, there was also, there's also things like um, women refusing to pay their fair share of the household bills, even though they earned equal or more amounts than the men. Um, so the man had to be um, the sort of lead breadwinner for all the household bills and stuff. While for the woman, her money was her own and she would spend it on whatever she wanted, often frivolous um, items. Um, and then um, also expecting an extravagant lifestyle. There's one story that stands out for me where a man said um, his, his wife went out and, and bought a house with stables and suddenly horses. And um, he had to go out and get another job over the weekend in order to pay for that. So that has an economic impact on him, um, not just because he has to work all the hours God sends to support that lifestyle, but also because that cuts him off from having a private life of his own. Didn't have time to go and have time out with friends or, or anything else because everything was about um, having this uh, lifestyle that matched her wants. So I've just pulled up on my um, report here. There's a, there's a table that actually gives you um, a percentage by the fact that the items that we included in our survey, of which there are uh, 45 off the top of my head, um, there is actually two parts because we ran two, two tables in there. So if I look at table one, if anyone's looking at the, the report while they're listening to this, in the economic section, we have items such as made it difficult to work or study, control my money, keep own money a secret and refuse to pay fair share. And we measured this on a Likert scale from never, uh, rarely, sometimes, often and always. And in order to establish a pattern of abuse, which is how coercive control yeah. is defined, we only measured those that were sometimes, often or always. We made the decision that if it was rarely or never, clearly, then it, it wouldn't be what could be classified yeah, as, yeah. as a pattern of abuse and therefore coercive control. So here, for example, in our first survey, making it difficult to work or study, 87% of the men answered sometimes, often or always. And in this particular um, survey, control my money, 71%. And then in the second survey, it was 50% of men that said they had their money controlled. But you can see that there's the elements that we have traditionally or historically said that these uh, commonsensically affect women and not men because men are in patriarchal the um, theory, the breadwinner, the person that has more access to money. That's not true. It, it really isn't true. Um, and it certainly doesn't reflect where we are as far as um, equality in the workplace is concerned. Um, but yeah, that's uh, it was a, a bit of a misbuster as far as surveys go. And if I could just go back on back to where you started, were you saying that uh, men and men are experiencing the same um, patterns of abuse as women, and then there are these additional categories which seem to be gendered to some extent. Um, but what about the influence of violence? Because that's always one which is brought out, which is women suffer more violence. Yeah. But is how, how equal yeah. is that? Or how does the balance work out there? Well, in this report, we didn't look at physical violence as a, as a particular focus, but we are doing as, as we move through the, the, the data. And um, the issue there is that when we're talking about physical violence, we tend to have this image that this is a man and a woman, a great big bloke and a, a little woman, and they're having a physical fist fight. And I'm, I'm sure in, in some cases um, that, that's true. However, what the men were telling me in 
our research is what we've seen in the literature previously is women that are physically violent, weaponized. And weaponized isn't as glamorous, you know, going to go get a handgun or whatever. This is everyday household objects, um, kettles, um, belts, uh, kitchen knives, uh, glasses, all sorts of things. So the, there was a man, and I think I've said, I don't know if I think I've said this to you before, but there was a man that was showing um, particularly high PTSD levels. And I, I, was, I was going through the data and, and seeing that a lot of that was around sleeping patterns and, and things like that. So again, I, I went back through and started to look at how he was discussing his experience. And it came about that he was um, frightened of the violence from his partner because she would often, and that's, that's terrifying when you think what I'm about to say, um, wake him up in the middle of the night by throwing a boiling kettle on him. Now, of course, he's going to have issues with sleeping post-traumatically yeah. because his body is and has experienced that kind of trauma whilst being asleep. So this is, not only do women weaponize, but they tend to weaponize when men are vulnerable. Either they're asleep or they're ill or they're disabled or they're drunk. You know, there's, there's, there's various ways that women can get the upper hand physically using physical violence. And I asked a question about how, um, how much do you think you've recovered since since the uh, abusive relationship and and men were saying well I, you know some men were, had felt they had um some me some men said no still still haven't because it took me so long to get out of there because I, I had nowhere to go I didn't I didn't want to put it on I didn't want to be a burden to my friends and family um I was ashamed I was embarrassed um, uh, but I had nowhere to go. And a lot of men were saying that they didn't actually reach out for a service, even if they thought that service was available because they were worried that they were going to be seen as the perpetrator. Yeah. And that, you know, we, we've seen that in, there's, um, there's uh, the Respect Men's Advice Line. If you, if you actually look at the standards, their report there, there's a number of questions in there that requires a man not only to prove that he's a victim, I don't know how you can evidence that half the time, particularly over the phone if you're phoning a helpline, but not only does it ask them to prove that they're a victim, it, it asks them for evidence of how they're not a perpetrator. We would never ask that of women, yeah. yet we do it for men. Really, this should be information which people welcome, but I, I get the impression that it's not welcomed. People were genuinely surprised, but they've taken it on board. And, and actually, there's a lot of people that have adopted this and used, started to use it already Good. in their service provision, which is absolutely joyous for me. Yeah. It's, it's strange to put it that way, but to, to know that this is actually having an effect is, is incredible. Yeah. And there are some people on the very opposite end of that spectrum that um, are framing it as, irrelevant, corrupt, um, not possible. And that, that might be because they have um, personal experience that doesn't allow them to be able to accept this type of data. Um, or more often than not, they have a vested interest. And that vested interest might not be in a particular company or service provision, but they certainly have a vested interest in believing that this is untrue. And I, I think for some people, they hold that belief of patriarchal theory so dear to them that this is a direct challenge, not just to um, the sort of narrative, the, the common narrative, but to their actual belief system, their personal belief system, that I'm saying everything that you've been told or you've been led to believe is untrue. My impression is that um, men are often brought up with a, a dismissive attitude towards um, traumatic experiences. That is, they're supposed to brush them off and cope with them without becoming preoccupied or mm. um, Stiff too, too, too emotionally distressed by it. You're mm. supposed to cope with it. 
And, and yeah, the danger and there was... is, of course, that the people that emerge in your survey are only there for a proportion, the proportion who are happy to acknowledge that they've got a, um, a problem with, with being abused mm -hmm. or traumatized. There may be many yes, more who are simply not acknowledging it because it's not part of their way of looking at the world or themselves in the world. Yes, I absolutely agree 100%. And that's why one of the recommendations we've put in here is uh, uh, certainly uh, either an adaption or a um, national campaign of the likes that we've seen for campaigns for, for raising awareness of female victims of domestic abuse. You know, if um, often we, we've seen an increase in women coming forward because we've put a campaign out there you know, as, as a nation, we've put campaigns out there that have said enough, stop this violence. We want violence against women to be stopped. You know, and, and there's been a drive to actually raise awareness. I haven't seen anything that vaguely comes close to that. Certainly not in lockdown. We had such, such messaging about the, the safety of women in, in lockdown, which mm. I completely agree with. However, where was the safety of men? And it's, it's almost as if there's silos within governmental departments where you've got the Office for National Statistics that's going, well, we've found even a third of, of victims of domestic abuse are men. And then, so that data gets put out by the government, but all the governmental agencies that are involved in actually enacting this or getting it out there or doing something about it, then seem to just completely ignore it. Mm. And it seems, it, it seems I'm, I'm, I'm literally listening to people talking about stuff or reading the domestic abuse framework that's, that's not long been released, thinking your own numbers contradict you. How can you put this out? How, how can you, and that's without any national campaigns, without any great surveys or anything to do with raising awareness for about male victims and the, the trauma that men sustain in, in domestic abuse, still a third of the victims are men. So you're absolutely right to, to say, what is that actually hiding? What is, what is the, there's obviously a background to that because we haven't even started to unpick the reality of this. Some of those myths, were absolutely I questioned in the first survey it was it was asking because we're often told that men don't feel fear violence and, and abuse towards men is trivial if at all it happens and they don't feel any impact from that and clearly I asked the question um, are you frightened or were you frightened of your ex-partner and 76% of men said yes they were and they gave me a myriad of answers from physical violence violence to the children, um, smear campaigns, all they would harm even pets, all sorts of things of what they were frightened of. But men's fear manifests differently. So whilst women tend to be or say that they are frightened of the perpetrator directly, men were telling me that they were frightened of the behaviour and the consequences of the behaviour of the perpetrator, which sounds like a very subtle difference. And it is. But it's an importantly subtle difference when you talk about asking questions, because most of the questions that are asked are often based on female experience. So if they said, if you, and I'll give you context to that. If I asked a man and a woman, um, are, you, are you frightened of the perpetrator of your abuse? A woman might just say yes, and a man might say no. But then the question goes, it goes to a different question. But if you said, were you frightened of the actions of your perpetrator? The man might say yes at that point, because men tend to recognize the behaviors rather than the titles. So if you say to a man, does she hit you? Does she starve you? Does she take your money? Has she threatened to take your children away? They might say yes to all of them. But if you said to them, are you a victim of domestic abuse? They might say no. Yeah. So it's understanding how they express their experience which is why I've done a lot of linguistic analysis on on this data going forward because my recommendation would be is if you're going to ask a national survey then you need to have slightly separate questions depending on the gender of the experience. Being frightened is a very particular thing isn't it because um mm -hmm. Uh, really the effect has to be is the, the the effect we measured is the behavior it's not 
some abstract internal experience which you could describe as being frightened it's what but do also, you actually do i'm with you that we shouldn't be focusing on whether or not fear indicates intent or or outcome so if someone is intent on harming someone and they don't manifest that fear by saying i am terrified or i am frightened but the outcomes can be measured for example uh, almost 80% of the men, so that's eight out of 10 men, were showing levels of post-traumatic stress that would be indicative of developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, I think it was 43% of the whole of, of the men were showing post-traumatic stress levels that would indicate an impact on their immune system for up to 10 years after the, after the traumatic event. So even if the men weren't frightened, it still manifested biologically and psychologically it, the outcome. The outcome still manifested. But trying to define how they feel that at that point skews it if you're talking about fear. But fear, fear uh, the difference between one form of arousal and another is very often the label you choose to attach to it. I'm sorry to kind of Absolutely. keep labouring no, no, no. labouring it, but it depends on how you label no, the no, experience no. you're totally. having. Because you can't tell yeah. the difference between arousal due to fear from arousal due to excitement by any outside physiological or internal physiological measurement. It's how the person chooses to interpret yeah. the experience. So stage fright is almost indistinguishable from just excitement, the fact you're going to perform. It's the label Absolutely. you attach. So using that label Absolutely. as your way of defining the problem is, is uh, the modern language, problematic. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's problematic, not just for male victims, but as someone who has survived high levels of, of coercive control herself, there were times when I um, felt I was being treated wrong and things weren't right, but I wasn't frightened of them. And actually, I was being abused. I can I can almost kind of go back into travel back in time with my knowledge of coercive on, yeah. control. Yeah, and 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 watch what the experience that happened and think, yes, you were being coercively controlled at that time. But there were particular things where I wasn't frightened, that sort of absolute terror, but I was being abused. Now, if you're going to label coercive control as you have to be terrified all the time, you're also doing women a disservice female victims because sometimes coercive control doesn't manifest like that even in women mm. so you're you're reducing the recognition for victims across the board to an outcome that you think helps your ideology not the victim so you have to understand from the people you interview in what way is their life being affected or restricted, if you choose to be more precise, mm. by the behaviour of their partner or by the behaviour of the other, it, it's and, and actually that's that's what we did in the yeah. in the coercive control survey. We asked about impact on um, physical health, psychological mm -hmm. health, and what um, the uh, main protagonist in coercive control calls space for action. And space for action is a really good way to describe the impact of coercive control because it's about you having the ability and the freedom to make decisions about your life yourself. Now, again, it's one of those things that's really difficult to define <laughs> because we all make compromises within relationships um, to, for, for the benefit of the, of the relationship. However, if you've been cut off of, from all your friends and family, you don't have the capability to decide if you have money to spend, let alone what you spend it on, and there are extreme versions such as being told what to eat and when to eat it, that's clearly coercive. And we, we had a look at that, and men were telling us all the time, and again, that's some of the things that, that I've put in the report. I'll just find uh, the right page. So um, we looked at space for action, and some of the words, um, I, I really, really like, word clouds i don't know if if you know what they are but essentially it's a big yes, cloud yes. of words Describe and the, it though, the yes. large the, the larger the word um the more frequently that word has been used 
Um, so it's it's not it, it's nothing um, uh, scientific, but it is strangely enough when you start analysing um, <laughs> linguistics. But when what I what page are you on in the report, Deborah? What page uh, is it? I'm, I'm I'm on page eighteen. Right. So it's a uh, space for action, and um, this is by this. This is a, a, a reference Stark and Hester here because they use this um, quite prevalently. So some of the language that I wanted you to be aware of whilst reading this was that men were saying, when we asked them, "Has this had an impact on your freedom and choice?" Men were saying that they were trapped, controlled, restricted, limits, impact, and then they were also really discussing family, children, finances, courts, decisions. So you can see there the kind of impact that men were telling us was having on their freedom to make decisions about their, their own life and their own actions. And then there's, there's quotes on there. Um, so for example, looking at the children, the, the quote here is, she had the power to take my child away. She had the power to destroy my career. If she did either of those things, she'd have taken everything I was. So you can see how this can have a real impact on how seemingly the um, dominant gender can be controlled in um, slightly different ways using slightly yeah. different mechanisms. De Deborah, what would you what do you have a way of understanding um, when things reach a threshold for being pathological? Do you have a, a sense of how you would distinguish between the ordinary relationship in which people cooperate and fit in with the other person's expectations and requirements and when it becomes I, pathological how do you do that how do you work that in your I, I think when 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 you're in a, a, a so I hate to use the word normal but when you're in an ordinary um, um, coercively control free shall we say um, relationship there are there are compromises but you are still very much able to make decisions independently of your partner or you know there's whether you choose to or not is your decision but you are able to you are able to say to your friend yes I'll meet you for a coffee and then tell your partner or you're, you're able to go out and buy yourself a, a pair of shoes or what, whatever it is or, or buy yourself lunch without fear of recrimination <laughs> but it becomes pathological and it becomes pathological slowly that's that's the issue here it's not it's drip 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 and people often com often compare it to the, the frog in the pot of water, um, that you'll, you go from being, um, from having that usual compromise of feeling, especially in the beginning of a coercive relationship, because people often refer to things like being love bombed and it being, you know, very mm -hmm. um, intense. Um, and we've all, we've all felt that in our time in relationships, but this, this switches to, um, rather than going, oh, do you want to come out with me tonight, rather than your friend, to all of a sudden, you are not going out with your friend now. And if you do go out with your friend, when you get back, all hell is to pay. And or there will be some kind of restriction or punishment for you doing that. But one of the things that we're working on from this data, and like I said, we've, we've got a whole stream of papers that we've, we've got planned and, and, and methods to do it. But if you look in the appendix, let me just take you down to page 26. On page 26 of the report, you'll see this um, funny kind of spoked wheel with um, put you yeah. down in the centre. Yeah. And one of the things I really wanted to show is that coercive control is very complex, but it's also ins insidious. So it's difficult to evidence, it's difficult to describe, it's difficult to show in court, it's difficult for the police to gather evidence, which is crucial in this. And, and I can't express that to you on a professional and personal level, how important the police are in this, in this situation. But what, what we've started to do, and um, I'm, I'm a bit analog, I, I absolutely love technology i love um the software i use for mm -hmm. research but i'm also a huge fan I'm, i mean it's that geeky i write with fountain pens and stuff so i like to actually print stuff out highlight stuff link it together and go full-on old school on data <laughs> so what what we've started to do here 
is to, and we will take this through to factor analysis, but just with correlation, start to map out the links between what can seem trivial types of abuse and how they are uh, linked to different types and layers of abuse. So in this particular um, cohort, I took put you down. And to give people an example, uh, if you've got a correlation that's like 0.1 or 0.2, it's quite low. Anything that's 0.3 to 0.5 is, is moderate. And then that and the up to one is strong. Um, so here what I did is, and this is just a snapshot of what I did because I literally printed out this full correlation table of 45 items and then mapped every single one with a pen and started to make sure I, I knew where it all was. <clears throat> so if, um, and, and in my mind, I was thinking, if a police officer arrived at a scene of domestic abuse, and because this is about male victims, he's talking to a man, and the man says, she puts me down all the time. It can be kind of like, really? Is that abuse? Is it? But actually, what I would like to do eventually is develop something maybe an app, where a police officer could choose an item and then other questions would pop up to say, there are other things that are correlated to this. Question this, question that, question the other. So that there's a tailor-made um, questioning depending on how the victim is communicating what's happening to them. So on this, this spoky wheel thing here, I must think of a more scientific name than spoky wheel. <laughs> but... Um, so putting, putting you down sits in emotional coercive control in our items. But you can see that if I take it from sort of one o'clock round to four o'clock, all those items there that are in that sort of brownie golden colour are to do with intimidation. And that can be showing you up, telling you you're mad, saying you're confused or lying. And those two are the sort of um, gaslighting elements of coercive control calling you unpleasant names. And then from five o'clock through to eight, the blue is isolation. So trying to make you jealous, limiting activities, restricting time with friends and family. And then uh, the yellow is threats, threatening to harm or threatening to, to disclose information. And then the green is economic, not paying fair share. So all of a sudden you've got a, a, a network of different types of abuse that could be correlated to putting you down. And I did that for every single one of these 45 items so that you can see how you could build up. So if there's gaslighting, so someone telling you you're mad, what are the other things that people should maybe think about asking questions about? And of course, people have individual experiences, but it gives us actual data-led evidence to say, if someone's experiencing this, there's a likelihood that they will also be experiencing this, 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 and this. I think, I mean, one of the things what you're saying is making me wonder about is whether what you've called put, put you down is actually the core of the harm done by this kind of abuse. That is, it's a, it's a harm to your self-respect and your self-esteem. Mm. And each of the abusive things that may come into play has that fundamental effect. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so if you wanted to define where it becomes pathological is at some level at which somebody's self-respect is um, being harmed. Deteriorated, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and there are measures of self-respect. There are rating scales, aren't there, for self-respect and self-esteem, yeah. which, which presumably have cutoffs, at which point people are familiar with saying, well, this is a pathological level of low self-respect, low self-esteem. So it might and, be and that you can measure a severity that way. Yeah, the, well, we used, in, in this survey, we used something called the impact of event scale that right. has been used across all kinds of trauma, whether it's um, disease, natural disaster, terrorism, hmm. um, all, all, all sorts of events. So it's, it's, it's incredibly um, robust and incredibly reliable. And in there, it has, it, it measures post-traumatic stress and it has cutoff levels that say at this point, we, that would be clinical concern. 
And then there's points where, like I said, so at clinical concern, 80% of the men that answered that, that scale were, at eight, were over clinical concern measures. And um, 43% of the total group were at such high levels that it would have an impact on their immune system. Well, that's a very so interesting point as well, this impact on the immune system, because um, if I could just digress a little bit, we've started talking mm -hmm. to some of the postmasters yeah. caught up in the post office scandal yeah. where they were treated as though they were criminals um, by mm. the post office when they knew they were innocent. But became criminals through being convicted well, you know, they, in the they, eyes of others. You, you so know. they were shamed in their community. Yeah. But their self-respect was demolished. And mm. enormous numbers of them, a huge proportion of them, have suffered from uh, physical illness and kind of autoimmune yeah. illnesses. So it clearly there is a real physical impact of these traumatic Absolutely. experiences. Absolutely. You know, I, again, speaking from personal experience, um, I thought I had um, carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm -hmm. And um, because I, I had such pain in my hands, my hands used to literally not be able to, to stretch out. And I was I went through nerve tests and all the rest of it was told I was asymptomatic to the point where I actually had the operation on, on my left hand. And actually, af not long after that, um, that particular procedure, I was due to go in for the, the operation on my right hand. And um, that was the end of my court cases. I'd been in court for six years and a judge who I'd managed to have for a number of hearings so she could recognize a pattern, not only dismissed the case that was brought against me there, but also said, I find the, um, the, the other person has been vexatious. So you now have to apply to the court to be able to apply to the court, mm -hmm. which was um, probably a the tremendous first time release. I act. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was the, I, I remember, uh, and I was remarried by this point. And I remember um, just every, every motion coming out, crying, dancing, you know, <laughs> all, all sorts of things. And just, just saying, I actually finally feel divorced he, he can't he can't take me to court anymore and and I was in court a lot um and literally the pain stopped it stopped yeah. and I went back to the doctor didn't have to have the next procedure because you can imagine being that tense all the time that hyper vigilant all the time uh, the, the levels of cortisol and and, and stress hormones that are going to be flying through your body it's just it if it doesn't have an effect I would be surprised. One of the things that I found um, really led me into this research was that um, you're, you're often told that you're a victim of domestic abuse because you're a woman. And actually, in a lot of the documents and even a lot of the sort of mission statements of the, the leading domestic violence uh, services for women says violence, is, violence against women is perpetrated by men against women because they are women. Now, A, that's a bit of a crappy definition of it. But, but B, that means that I was a victim of domestic abuse by birth. So if I, if I wanted to overcome that victimhood, what do I do with that? I'm a woman. Am I a perpetual victim? Because I know for absolute certain that the person that perpetrated domestic abuse and coercive control against me didn't do it because I was a woman. He did it because of all sorts of issues, but not because I was a woman. And that's that. I think that, what are we teaching? What what is it we're doing for to, for female victims if we're telling them you're a victim of domestic abuse because you're a woman? It's 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 horrendous. But then there's female perpetrators. Female perpetrators programs are few and far between. And if they're based on the Duluth model, they're literally not going to be really effective because what they're going to say is, well, you did it in self-defense and, and any violence that you committed against a man is trivial and they don't feel anything from it anyway. But right at the center of all those people are children. Absolutely. There, there are children at the center of this that are experiencing it, witnessing it, feeling it, living with it and growing up with it. And if we don't actually take an adult stance and go, patriarchal theory, great, you can believe that. If you want to believe that and get on with things, that's fantastic. 
But let's look at all the clinical issues that go along with domestic abuse. Let's look at all the social issues that go along with domestic abuse. Let's have a look at how we've actually framed this and what we've been doing for the past 50 years. 